In my introduction, I mentioned that this was an interactive online course. We make it interactive with the inclusion of historical thinking activities. So in our look at this American tale, the migration story and the music of George and Ira Gershwin, let me review the method to our madness. In the history classroom, we like to think of history as an action verb. Stuff is happening. Kids are doing history. We think of it as a laboratory where teachers and students ask questions together. What we're doing here is creating a community of scholars. Scholars that co-investigate the past. We determine the credibility of sources. Consider the source. We also improve students' historical knowledge by using primary sources to enhance and reinforce the knowledge base that was the foundation of this look at a particular time in history. We are not the blind leading the blind. The teacher is a professional in the classroom and directs instruction. Think of yourself as quality control. Together, this community of scholars examines the past, trying to make meaning of the present. And really importantly, when interpretations are made in the community, they are based on evidence. I like to call it the stairway to heaven. When I taught the methods classes in history education at ASU, I said, you know you've nailed it when you've gone beyond just the basic facts. Yes, facts are very important. Knowledge is very important. Historical context, incredibly important. It's important to know names and dates. It's important to know places. It's important to know concepts. But then we must introduce primary sources, take kids to that next step where they have to do mental gymnastics, wrestle with the information through historical thinking. They must use reasoning and make the scholarship their own. Give them the opportunity to be truly a part of the community of scholars by becoming a scholar. Give them the time to think. And then the best step is when you've reached heaven and a kid can come up with their own interpretation, an interpretation that might be so diverse from what everybody else is thinking. But when they say it or present it or, or draw it or sing it, whatever it might be, when they communicate their ideas, it's based in evidence from that knowledge base and their interpretation of primary sources. That scholarship becomes their own. They become historians. A stairway to heaven. You've known you've nailed it when kids are involved in their own scholarship. What we want to do is to introduce to students in this community of scholars how historians think. This is not just his critical thinking. This is historical thinking. And there's four basic characteristics that a, an historian like Eric Foner pictured here. That these, there are things that they use. There are, there's a habit of mind, if you will, a way in which they think that we've got to train our kids to do. The first thing that they do is they source the heuristic. Even before they read the text, they ask questions about the author. Is this author credible? What, is, what could possibly be the author's motivations? And were they there? Did they participate in the events of the time? We also take a look at who could have possibly been the intended audience for this particular source. Before we even start reading, we consider the source. The second heuristic is the corroboration heuristic. 
where we relate documents to others of the same period. Think of a debate. You just don't want to hear one side of the debate or have kids interpret and analyze one argument. You want them to have multiple perspectives. So relate the documents to others. Have the students compare information that they've learned from several documents. This gives them layers of understanding. Layers, so many layers. Yes, history is complex. Yes, history can be confusing, but that's what makes it so fun. The next aspect in trying to get in the historian's brain, how they think, the next thing they do is they contextualize. They put the primary source in a time frame. In other words, what's going on when this particular source was created? What's going on? Compare this source to other contemporary accounts. Also make sure that students, when they're thinking historically, remember the linguistic context. The meaning of words in certain times in our history are different than what they currently are. For example, the word compromise. Considered the art of statesmanship prior to the Civil War. But if you call a politician today compromising, they're a flip-flopper. It's not a good connotation. It was a statesmanlike word in the 19th century. It is not considered a badge of honor for a politician today. Also, I think clearly, the word gay. Gay meant happy. Gay means a sexual orientation. Now, have kids beware of linguistic context. The last thing is comparative thinking. No event, no one event happens in a vacuum. We must take a look at this event and compare it to conditions in other parts of the world. I often taught my students, it's not what the source says, it's what the source does. People do not create sources. They don't leave us their thoughts because they want us to just look at what this thing says. They had a purpose, they had a motivation, and then did they deliver? Not just what the source says, but what the source does. So, yes, kids read the source, but they also must investigate the author's intention, their motive, their purpose, and what might the audience reaction be. It must be related to other documents. And never ever should a primary source be read without historical context. Historical context must be the foundation. That's the first step, knowledge. Words and actions have different meanings in time and place. Do not take a primary source out of context. It will lose its meaning. And make sure that you compare with other ideas and events in other parts of the world at that time. Yes, the primary source may be local, but it exists in a global context. In this course, we have a number of ways in which you can use historical thinking through analysis guides. We have created the guides that will help you use photography, paintings, documents, poetry, music, and art. Our analysis guides, Visualizing History, has a number of techniques that you can use when you're looking at paintings or photography. Document analysis, whether it's a speech, a radio broadcast, a letter, a diary, a memoir. We have a guide, no matter where it takes place, no matter what time frame. 
A document analysis guide. It's the same process for any document that you use. Same thing with our poetry analysis guide. Poetry gives a voice to people who want to react or change their situation. We have a poetry analysis guide using poetry as a primary source. Same thing with music. Music is a little bit trickier, but our guide, the music analysis tool, will truly help you in using music very effectively as a primary source in your classroom. And then the art analysis guide will allow you to use painting, photography, in historical context because a picture does tell a thousand words, but what is the intention of the photographer? These analysis guides will be used throughout the course. You will practice with them and then hopefully you will use them with your students. So the historical thinking activities for the first two weeks of this course in week one, when we study Jewish migration, we will use the Visualizing History Guide. We will take a look at the photography of Lewis Hine and demonstrate how photographs could be used as a primary source in getting kids either ready to learn or reinforcing their learning. We will also analyze a document together and use the Document Analysis Guide this is a speech before Congress. It is a speech on the 1924 quota law. The document analysis guide could be used for any document, but we'll use it for the 1924 quota law in week one. And then there will be a number of different musics in our first week of the Jewish migration topic. We will practice describing and analyzing music. The music of Tin Pan Alley, the music of French composers, the music of Eastern European composers. We'll let you practice a bit of describing and analyzing music before in week two, we actually use the full-blown music analysis tool.